Okay. Yep. Carl, meeting to order. Is there any new additions to the items? I have been advised that there is one additional item uh, raised by Councillor O'Neill, PC on the move, 10 year transportation plan. I have one. Craig? Yep. Uh, garbage uh, collection, particularly in the area of the, around the, uh, the Bears. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything to cover? Is there a matter to include those items? All those in favor? Balls carry. Okay, first item. Item 1 are minutes of the Council Committee meeting held Monday, October 6, 2014. The recommendation is to approve those so minutes. Second. second. Bradley Wooden, second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item. Item 2 is a report regarding the Poirier Drive floor facility project status and update. We have introductory comments by the General Manager of Strategic Initiatives and a presentation by the Manager of Facilities, Planning, and Construction. That's a very good catch, by the way. Oh, you saw that. Thank you. Through the chair, um, just some very brief introductory comments, and then I'll hand it over to Brent for uh, uh, just some pictures of uh, the facility. Um, so far, the facility has been going well. The construction of the facility is going well. It's, um, it's a very high-quality project. We're putting the time and the effort to make sure it's a very high-quality project because We've never built a structure like this before in the city. It is a first for the city, and um, so we're proceeding with caution. Um, and um, if uh, I don't know if any of you have been able to drive by it, but uh, we were there last week, and um, I think they're doing a very good job. Um, you'll see in the report that um, there was um, a bit of a challenge with the concrete tender, which we addressed very quickly and swiftly that prevented us from delaying this project even further. Um, with the different method methodology we chose when the original low bid for the entire pour um, could not adhere to the original specifications. We decided to go with um, an in a, a separated pour that we could do right away while we retendered for pour number two and pour number three. So we did that. We, we regrouped very quickly and tried to make sure that we minimized any delay associated with the project. And we are within budget, and um, we are within completion pretty soon. They're just starting to uh, deliver the um, structure today, if, if anybody was out there. I think they've uh, delivered the second uh, trailer load of material. The third one will be delivered tomorrow. They're going to start to uncrate tomorrow and then start to assemble. And then you'll actually start to see a skeleton go up and then the fabric covering on it. So um, that's kind of in a nutshell where we're at today and uh, Brent has some pictures he just wants to show you. Okay, Brent? Thank you very much. Um, these, all these pictures were taken on or about the, uh, the, well this is the, I'm just trying to see here, this is the first pour uh, of the the actual playing surface. Um, the original pour for the foundation is on the outside there. Um, this took all day uh, with, you can see the boom truck there. Uh, at count there was several dozen or a dozen or more of the um, concrete trucks uh, that went through it all and they pour and they slog through there and while they're doing that they're pouring at one end, they're finishing at another, um, and at the end of it, they uh, soak it with water and leave the water on there to slow down the, um, the curing rate of the exterior of the concrete so the interior can cure at the same time. Um, that's all done and looks great now, and as Perry said, we're going to start to build uh, starting tomorrow. Can you go back to the first slide? Um, I think it was the first, yeah, right there, the second slide. No, the other, the next one, that one there. I just, just want to make sure the council is aware that this was done in three pours. This was pour number one that went all the way around the perimeter, mm -hmm. like footings and foundation. And that was the pour that we were able to do concurrent to getting a tender out for the other two pours, for this one and this one. This was the second pour, which was, this is the actual play surface area. That's a bit thicker than the outside um, where the, the seating is going to be. So this was the second pour. 
And this was the third pour. There's an expansion joint that you cannot see here that sits in between this concrete and this slab. And so this was poured. They put the expansion joint, stripped everything, and then poured the last pour, which is a perimeter. So that's how the concrete, which is a large component of the structure, went in. And also, okay, and we'll have a speaking order of uh, Craig Hodge, May Reed, and Karen. Okay, well, I'm glad we got the cement down. I know that this was because there was some anxiety around uh, the timing because uh, given that we're pouring outdoors, uh, normally a floor like this is poured inside a, a structure with uh, controlled conditions. So uh, um, I'm, I'm glad we got this in, and I, I think by all accounts with, uh, with minimal disruption. Um, I guess the concern I have now is that, and thinking back to what we went through with the, uh, the construction over at TC North Field, um, where all the components for the, the field and all the, you know, the, uh, the material and everything had to be stored on site. Um, we have to expand the, sort of the construction area for a period of time just while we have a lot of material on site. And I'm just wondering from a, from a parking standpoint, uh, if, if we have a plan in, in place to manage that because we're going to lose, I'm assuming we're going to lose a little bit more parking during this phase of the operation. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, there was an attachment. Into it, yeah. um, that expands our lay down area. Okay. That one there. Right. Um, so, two, four, six, eight, ten, or twelve. We're not creating new parking anywhere else. No. Uh, but as of today, we have taken over that yellow area. Um, the four stalls to the north that are are um, handicapped are still yeah. there Good. and available. Okay. So. No, so we have, we've lost a little bit, but that that'll be during the during the period when the structure is going up, and then eventually all the fencing will come down, and that will be that will this be entire return. area through the chair, the the yellow and the green area. That was the entire original staging area okay. that we're, we were able to contract back to the green right. area for right. the majority. Fortunately, so we, yeah, we for the pull, majority, we pull it back during we the pull special it back events. And now we have to go and back expand. to the correct. To the, and, and this is a temporary stage where we're going to have to use the entire original again. area. And we're going to pull that back when we're able to. As soon as we can, it'll, yeah. it'll come back. That's right. And and I guess more, this may be best addressed to, uh, to engineering. I know that right now up there, because Centennial is also undergoing construction, that, uh, that there is this going to be this period of time where we don't have a lot of parking. Uh, my understanding was is that there were some issues with the, uh, the parking with Centennial Secondary School students in this area. And has that been worked out? I'm just, my big concern is that uh, with losing some parking here, and possibly Centennial Secondary School students not parking where they're supposed to be. Are, are, are we sort of patrolling that or making sure that, uh, that while parking is at a premium that, uh, that the, the Dogwood residents do have, or, or Dogwood users do have access to, uh, to as many of those spots as possible and that we're not losing spots to, uh, say, uh, to the secondary school students? Yes, there is a, a section of the Dogwood parking lot that has been leased or rented to school district, or specifically the, uh, the school. Uh, they have a deckling system. Some, uh, some of the teachers and some of the students have received decals, and they're allowed to park in there. Okay. On major events, like the last one was the Thanksgiving lunch, uh, we had people down there confirming that anybody parked in that area had a decal, okay. and if they didn't, they were asked to vacate and it seemed to work quite well. Okay. okay. So I just want to make sure that at a time where we, we have lost a bit of parking, I recognize it's just temporary, but during that period if we just make sure that we do enforce that uh, that we don't lose spots to unauthorized parking because as I said we've lost a, a bit here during this and I, I think we want to make sure that uh, we mitigate much of the of the construction impact uh, as we can during the particularly during this uh, this stage of the construction yeah and, and just to be clear in in conjunction with Judy Hamanishi up there mm -hmm. um, we're putting out um, staff to monitor when there is a special event it, it's not uh, feasible to, okay. to put them out there when there is no. an event. So if there's no event, there may be students parking there that okay. shouldn't. 
So we're working with uh, with Dogwood and our group, and that's that's great. I was up there for the pour, and I and I thought it went really well because it happened at a, at a day that there happened to be an event, which I gathered we just had to go when we had the weather. And uh, but I, I was happy to see that there were lots of flag people out yep. there, and that uh, you know people were making you know that they were making sure that there was an orderly flow of uh, of uh, civilian traffic in there as well as sort of uh, coordinating the, the number of trucks that it was required to do a, a, what was actually a very complex uh, pour. So mm -hmm. that uh, and we were able to do that. I think that was probably in the second port, and they were doing that one. But uh, I was I was pleased to see that. So uh, um, looking forward to starting to see the structure come up. And uh, thank you to, uh, to everybody so far on this. It's uh, coming together. Thanks. Okay, Mayor, you're ready to go. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Council Reed. Is it me? Yes. Oh. Okay. I hate to say this is a blog question, but it really is. So I want to talk about when we tendered it to the concrete supplier, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he gets the job and he doesn't know what to do with it. Did did it, what, were our tender documents <laughs> incorrect, know. or when he got it, did he realize he couldn't uh, confirm his ability to guarantee the quality of the playing surface? So what happened? And we used to have task. I remember task <coughs> instruction doing a lot of our stuff. So. Don't take this the wrong way, but do you guys have the expertise we need on staff to be putting these RFPs out? I just want to know because mm -hmm. when we get this on a little job, it's you know we can correct it, but if we get it on a big job, we may have a bigger problem. So what happened, and what money is he paying us back for the loss of time and the opening, and what kind of insurance do we have that we're going to be recompensated? Thank you. Through the chair, we do have the equivalent of task on this one. The company is called Yellow Ridge, but I'll, I'll have Brent oh, elaborate good. on that. Okay. Yep. Yellow Ridge Construction, uh, in conjunction with our civil consultant, uh, worked with us in preparing the tender documents. Everything was in the documentation. Uh, clearly laid out our expectations of a crack-free floor. <coughs> uh, the civil consultant. Crack-free. Crack-free. I got it, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, our civil consultant felt on that size it could be one pour one monolithic pour of both the playing surface and uh, the spectator area we had uh, two qualified bidders respond one of them being the people we were about to award the contract to we had our final meeting with them just for clarity and at that that is the first time that they said that they couldn't guarantee a crack free floor without additional um, product being added to the concrete, like a, a steel gotcha. fiber. And uh, that wasn't something that we had planned on, that the consultant felt we didn't need it. Um, so we uh, in turn rejected them. Uh, and instead After we awarded them no, or before? Before we awarded, okay. it was, uh, we have question. our final meeting with them to make sure everybody's on the same page, and they weren't. Um, we went, we so we just, dismiss their bid. We <coughs> went back to the drawing board to make sure how, how, how do we now uh, retender and still keep our schedule as close as possible. And that was to create three pours and an expansion joint, um, which we did. Uh, at this point, we're not uh, pursuing any uh, damages with them. We're just first trying to get through the construction. We'll have time to look at it with our legal department. We haven't addressed it. Well, if we didn't have an award, and it said prior to, yep. and I didn't see that, yeah. so well, I saw it, but I didn't want to pay attention to it, I guess. So I was concerned that, um, you know, that we didn't bid it properly or something like that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Council Neil. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see this is uh, progressing so well. Um, my questions are more looking ahead because there is some parts of the report that talk about facility opening and use. Uh, the first question has to do with something that we may need to talk about offline, and that's the um, any pursuit of any sponsorship agreements with this uh, facility and or naming. Can we talk about anything now? Um, um, at this point, um, we are, staff are in the process of preparing a, uh, some, some information on sponsorship, some opportunities long term. Uh, that report is not yet available, and once we develop that, we will bring some of that forward for Council. So it's uh, suggested we'll open this without a sponsorship agreement in place? 
Um, at this point, our, our plan uh, through the chair um, is to allocate this space and open the building for uh, starting in the new year. And the allocation plan is ready for, uh, for the, the, the winter allocation. Um, there, there are still opportunities potentially for sponsorship. Should council proceed in, in, you know, into the sponsorship realm, uh, there's still opportunities to look at opportunities within that building. I certainly want, would not want to hold up the opening of the facility to wait for a sponsorship agreement of some sort. Um, and, uh, and I personally would, uh, would like to continue pursuing that. We've talked about it generally in the past. And uh, I think it would be a great opportunity and uh, good for the taxpayers of Coquitlam to do that as well. Thank you. Now, you mentioned uh, segueing quite nicely into the next questions dealing with allocation. Um, and um, you do talk about how the allocation plan for 2015 is in place. and. Um, receiving out there as you're knocking on doors and meeting people in the last few weeks uh, questions about uh, the allocation there's a lot of usage uh, a lot of people people want to use this new facility um, was the allocation done um, after consultation with groups or was it done just by staff looking at previous uh, assessment of needs um, how was the allocation uh, done, completed uh, through the chair, um, all of the above. Uh, we, we, do, um, we do allocation a number of times a year. We have a good sense of the groups and users that are requiring of the space. Uh, we did talk to all the community groups and, and sport groups and associations, and including the, uh, the Dogwood <coughs> Pavilion, Poria Community Center programs are represented in there, um, uh, Coquitlam Metro 4, North, North Coquitlam, uh, Tri-Cities Female Ice Hockey is in there, um, Minor Softball, the Junior Adenax. I mean, it's an incredible range of both sport and culture, and um, uh, we've got a very good allocation program, as, as I see, but we have done all of the above. We have uh, um, some senior supervisory staff that work directly with the groups and to allocate um, dry space in all our dry floor facilities as well as arena space. Now, uh, some of us on council, probably all of us, have received a letter from the Coquitlam Sports Center Users Association just generally about the, the issue. Was, was there a direct consultation with that group um, regarding allocation of uh, usage? Uh, yes. Uh, again, through the chair, there was a direct consultation with the Arena Users Group um, on numerous occasions uh, back to uh, this summer. And, well, I personally attended a number of those meetings. Uh, the discussion with all of the groups, including the Arena Association, is that this is a broad use facility. It is intended to provide use for a wide range of both sport uh, and culture and recreation uh, uh, users. And we also emphasize through the allocation policy in season allocation. So sports that are in season typically get some priority. And the, the groups in that uh, in, the, in the Arena Association, uh, uh, we work very closely with them, and they're very instrumental in helping the community groups achieve uh, through council authority this facility, but we are trying to make sure we, we broaden the, the allocation to uh, all of the service uh, groups, and, and they're very, very familiar with our allocation. Okay. So when we first talked about this, going ahead with this uh, building, we heard a lot about uh, lacrosse and um, ball hockey, and things like that. Was there another big one we heard about? Can you give us an indoor soccer? Can you give no. me an idea of the sorts of the range of usages we're going to see in there now? So um, when we uh, complete the, uh, uh, get the boards in and what have you, we will line it for lacrosse, for um, ball hockey, for um, two volleyball courts and four badminton courts. Wow. Uh, badminton slash pickleball, they use the same court, just a lower net. So there's a wide wide range. Are those the main users, or what other what other sort of users are we going to see in there besides uh, like that sort of user? But thank you for that. So I'll just describe the um, the winter allocation just for a sense of what we're getting in winter. And, and keep in mind that ball hockey would be coming in, in in a little bit more strongly in, for instance, in the Mar in the March allocation beyond March. So in the the winter allocation, which is um, January 5th to March the 8th. We have Dogwood Pavilion groups, and that's pickleball and some of the activities there. Uh, Poria Community Center programs. We have Coquitlam Metro Ford and North Coquitlam United Soccer, both of the associations of soccer for practice uh, in, inside. Um, we've got the Tri-Cities Female Ice Hockey Association. They do some dryland training. Um, Coquitlam Moody Minor Baseball and uh, Minor Lacrosse, Tri-City Minor Ball Hockey. This is all training and, and uh, 
Um, Vancouver Inline Hockey League, they're doing some, some sport in there. Uh, Coquitlam Minor Softball, and then the Junior and Senior Adenox, Adenax Box Lacrosse teams. Um, now, um, you said Vancouver Inline Hockey League? Yes. Say? Now, is that a rental then? Are we renting? renting All of out? these, um, I'd have to look at the actual allocation. Some of these, it depends on, on uh, a number of factors, but uh, I could provide more information on, on what is a, what is leased. And, uh, but it, it, this is a group that I believe have previously used our, our dry floor facility, and we're trying to accommodate them within the, the profile. So, so they're... Okay, so there's a tremendous amount of desire to use use the, this new facility. Yes. From community groups. Yes. For whom we, um, and are there outside groups that not in the community? I'm, I'm trying to understand how the uh, how that works. Are outside groups that would? Well, the the allocation policy like has a swimming, like swimming pools. You know, I think we have a contract with the school district for some swimming pool use and things like that. But that's. Uh, and that's different than our normal allocation. So maybe you can explain that. The, I don't understand. Yes, uh, yeah, through the chair. The allocation does have, um, I'd have to go through the details of the allocation policy, but there's a residency requirement. So any group with a uh, certain number of Coquitlam residents uh, has priority. So it, you can name yourself anything you want, but if you've got 60, 70 percent Coquitlam residents, you get pr preference of allocation. So. It's a very tedious and complicated process to go through the allocation process and policy, but our, our staff are very good about detailing out the growth of each group, the residency, uh, how much is Coquitlam, the percentages, and then they go through and allocate on a percentage basis depending on the membership and Coquitlam uh, residency, the allocation space that's reasonable. Okay. Good to hear. Thank you very much, and I don't want this to get tedious, so I'll say I'm finished. Thanks. Councilor Zarello. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say I appreciate pulling back on the pores to get the best quality facility, so I really appreciate that problem solving and very quick problem solving in regards to that. Uh, just two points. The one is to go back to the parking. Uh, Councillor O'Neill mentioned it about being on the doorsteps. There's a lot of seniors that are uh, concerned about their loss of parking and especially for accessible. So I know we're losing those 12 spots, but those 12 spots are now much farther away from the door and there's a lot of seniors with accessibility issues. So I'd like to revisit it because is there a way for us to accommodate some more um, <coughs> parking for those that have the, the decal that, that have reduced mobility because it's a long way to walk from <clears throat> yeah, so is there something we can do in the back? Or is there something we can reconfigure in the front to get us some more accessible parking for the dogwood? Yes. Um, just to the west of the site we're showing, there's another uh, row of uh, parking, single stall. We can create, uh, I think, two handicap by utilizing three stalls. Okay. That could be done. Obviously, you're creating handicap, but you're taking away <clears throat> the net number of stalls you have. As you eliminate three to make two for handicap. And what about the back? Because I can't remember. Is there steps coming down if you try to get into dogwood from the back? Are there two steps coming down, or is it? Could we offer something on the back to like? Which, kind of, uh, as far as I can recall, everything is great at ground level. All the is way there anyone the on council? Is, is anyone have any thoughts on whether we could? Because I, I have heard that on the doorstep that they feel that they need some more um, accessible spots while while this is going on. So could we do that? Could we? Right, would, right on the sidewalk by. No, not yeah. necessarily. But just it's a it's a long way. Yeah. From the uh, front door to the, the parking lot there. To um, we could the easily, we, we could through the chair. What we'll do is we'll we'll have a look to see what there is available. I mean, we we obviously can. not you know, answer all of your questions now. We'll go back and have a real good look at it, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Brent has already suggested that we could maybe turn, you know, three into two uh, wheelchair accessible stalls. There might be other opportunities for that. I really don't know at this time, yeah. but we can look into that. And it crossed my mind, like, maybe there's some kind of valet service at the front where they can get out when you have an event on. But anyway, this is something that we really need to look at is that it's a, it's a long way from the other side to the front door if you have a... So if you can do that, that would be wonderful. Um, okay, the other thing I just wanted to mention was um, 
when I first saw the rendering of what it was going to look like on the corner of Winslow and Poirier, I had concerns that it wasn't going to be that beautiful, but there was trees in the rendering and it looked, it looked very nice. Well, all those trees have been removed and we have a retaining wall now that wasn't in the initial rendering. So I just wanted to get a feel for what is it going to look like when we're done? Are we replanting trees? What are the size of the trees that we're re replanting? And was the retaining wall always part of the project, just not on the rendering? Or how did the retaining wall come, come to be? The retaining wall was always on the rendering. It probably didn't show very well. But there is a significant landscaping plan. Uh, once, once we get the structure up, and there will be a number of trees and bushes and grass, um, basically to hide most of the uh, retaining wall. And that's part of the budget already? It's already part of the budget. That's great. Thanks very much. Sir Wilson. Thanks. Um, I have very similar concerns to Councilor Zarillo in terms of the accessible parking spots. We're losing four, um, and I think we have to make up those four <laughs> somewhere else. And I think that's that. And to me, I, I, that's that's a pretty big priority. Um, the, the arrangement we have with Centennial, how old is that arrangement? in terms of allowing Centennial students and staff to park in the dog Through the chair, that, that will um, uh, be for the life of the um, Centennial construction. That's so right. from the time that they started the construction until? Correct, but that's only, that's only during uh, the school season, September yes. to June. So did we enter into that agreement before mm -hmm. we planned to proceed with this project? through the chair yes we were not aware that we were going to have this project in the area at that time that we entered in that agreement with centennial and we, so therefore we were bound by the agreement yeah, yeah. we entered into with okay. the school district and then my only other question was was about the four and, and, and the original um contract and then and then we changed the contract and i guess i'm just trying to understand how did that how did us changing the contract and adding a third core help us stay on our timeline. It would seem to me that that would extend our timeline. Um, so by changing changing the way we were doing the four, how did that help us stay on, on track? Okay, it, it did, um, uh, making the change did extend or delay by a couple of weeks. Um, but had we not broken it up into three fours and just gone back out and retendered the monolithic four, um, we would have been out tendering for two or three weeks then analyzing. So when we broke it down uh, into the three, made the decision uh, to pour the foundation, we were able to pour the foundation very quickly um, and get that out of the way while, <coughs> while they were doing that and it was curing. That's when we went out and tendered uh, the other two floors, the, the playing surface and the spectator area. So although we did lose some time, we didn't lose as much by not redesigning. But there was always going to be two pores. There was going to be the found. Like there was going to be the foundation, foundation, and then there was going to be the, the, yeah. the monolithic yeah. pore. Yeah. Um, yes. So, but the timing of it um, changed with with the redesign, um, and the fact that we had to pour the plain surface, let it cure, then pour uh, the spectator area, let it cure, then we can build. So we, so we poured the foundation, yep. and then we went back out to tender for the second and third floors. Yes. If we had decided just to do the foundation and one monolithic core, we'd still have to go back out to tender to tender the monolithic core, correct? That's correct. Um, then we wouldn't have had that, that, that gap between the plain surface core and the uh, spectator core. Could you say that again? I'm not... Well, then we, then we wouldn't have had the gap between the second and the third. <coughs> That's correct. Fours. Yes. So, I'm just, I, again, I'm just trying to understand why we had to make that change. We, well, when we were talking to the consultant, we made that change because we were already going back out to tender. Uh, how do we eliminate this issue? I mean, it would be a disaster if we went out to tender and everybody applied, said they can do it, and they walked through the door again and say, you're going to have to add something to, to the cracks. Whereas right. if we say, okay, we're going to redesign it then, they're, you know, the other option, both are good, and just have an expansion joint pour two times, it, it eliminates 
the likelihood of someone else coming through the door and saying, well, we said we could, but we can't. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Mayor? So to clarify that, the model of the court less forgiving, obviously, because it's got a larger surface area to, to crack. So by, by breaking it up, you're, allowed, you're allowing control points effectively to allow the surface the freedom to move a small amount. Of yes. So I get that. The, and I do want to have a discussion. It won't be in this venue. It will be in another venue about, because I read the gender documents to figure out whether it was confusing. And if it wasn't confusing, it might have called for an official question or an official interpretation prior to bidding. But I don't think. So I, I would like to see us contemplate the course of action that we take. Because this con contractors have to have some measure of responsibility for the bids. Um, now, talking about the parking, because that was one of the issues I raised when we were talking about location, was um, the rest of the parking area is near the end of its life, uh, which was, I think, built in the 80s and 60s, or that the large amount of parking on the, on the west end. So it does need to be, at some point, redone, and probably redesigned so that we can get more, eat more parking out of it. Is there a way that we can um, redesign it slightly now to achieve more general parking, probably by poking through another or a pathway from the parking area directly to Winslow and allowing perhaps some, some perpendicular parking lot access for the back. But is there also a way to redesign this? So we had this chat before. This was always a, a, a weird design. Rather than having this, this loop um, putting, say, five uh, handicapped on both sides of the center core mm -hmm. and allowing an access through so we don't have the dead end as a backup. It's, it's an awkward place to, it's an awkward parking design at best. And now we think, can take the opportunity to add some, some of the wheelchair parking. I mean, Councilor Grill is right. This is, a, this is a challenge. We have more persons needing accessible parking. Not just wheelchair, though, because there's very few people who need wheelchair spaces. A lot of people simply need spaces near the entrance. And so allowing some ambulant parking for persons who just use a cane uh, that aren't necessarily a whole lot wider than Redesigning that front uh, to accommodate it in the short term. Is that uh, we're not at that stage now? When 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 can we talk about that? Um, I, well, we can talk about the redesign of this portion of the parking lot at any time. Um, there would be some excavating, tree removal, grading, and paving, which unfortunately I don't believe I have budget for. Uh, but oh, fair yeah. enough. But I think we do. This is an issue we have yep. to resolve because yep. the, the seniors need the parking. The, the facility needs the parking. Yep. That's a quarterly we don't talk. Uh, yes, that whole lot. If you eliminate a lot of those um, mediums, yes. uh, there's a lot of parking there. Yeah. Right. Even even down to the hedge. Uh, yeah. I agree. And the mediums do tend to make it less accessible for the people that are actually using it. Find walk through the or <laughs> walking all the way around because there's a there's just a medium there that's meant to look pretty, but it doesn't even look pretty anymore. It just slides and creates a problem. So I I like to see us move relatively quickly on elements of redesign to make it more efficient. Um, let me commit to at least pricing out this discussion if I understand it um, to eliminate these berms. And this trees, and basically just extend the parking as it is. Right. So here, as far as we can go, yeah, right. even higher. All wheelchairs. Uh, well, you, you need a fairly good. Yeah, we've got a turning radius here, so we could probably go up to about here. So I'll, I'll get that priced out. Uh, I wouldn't want to commit it to the project budget. Uh, it will be a separate project. Yeah. We oh, will yeah. pour back yeah. on a separate project with a funding source for that separate project. Mm -hmm. We will do that, and then the construction can be done um, in advance of. Mm -hmm whole next year's budget. Okay. It's a separate project and we'll, we'll propose a finance I suppose. And sorry, and the last thing, and it probably is much less expensive than that, that is to knock out a path type A. But the next row of parking to the west, not gonna access right through to Winslow so that we don't have to go the roundabout way that currently Drive, drivers are going all the way out. So they're trying to get it over. They've only done that. Uh, can we perhaps contemplate that gap?
out from the trees. You don't have to take so another the driveway. It's the driveway, then, yeah. An exit driveway, entrance and exit. Yeah. Would reduce the amount of congestion in the spot. Take it in more far Is it Okay, yeah, yeah. I have a couple items. Um, with that drive floor, you got those decals for a Centennial School parking. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I wouldn't believe that we would be ever allow somebody else to park in that Dogwood Premium parking lot. I mean, you know, when a function comes on, we're scrambling for parking. So why would we make a deal with Centennial School to give them parking at any time when we're short of parking spaces ourselves? Uh, never mind the building of the drive floor facility. And now it makes it worse, and I'm getting calls on it. Mm -hmm. Get people stop and say, "What is going on? How come all our parking is going away? We can't park." So you know, maybe maybe we should have had a deal with St. Daniel School when we're building this facility that we recall all those decals. There's got to be something something better than what we're doing, because as the mayor mentioned, building more park space, which I agree, but. The fact is, we're giving away a lot of parking spaces to Centennial for, for you know, for even even you know when when they're not building a drive floor space, there's a lot of kids, high school kids, parking that parking lot, and other people. So so we're losing parking space, and that's so I don't know how do we enforce it, how do we handle it, or, or does every member of the Dogwood Pavilion uh, have a sticker in their window? But the fact that they have a right to park, all others will be ticketed or towed or whatever it is. But those are the things that I think we need to study really. Otherwise, we'd be building park lots all over the city and still not have enough parking spaces. Another thing getting calls is not about handicapped parking spaces at Dogbert. The same handicapped parking space were there 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They're still the same, no more. And it's not enough. So we need to rethink that. Okay? Those are things that my comments. But I think that that Centennial deal, we should have had a deal with them to where this thing was being started to be built, that we just pull out those decals and not allow them to park there because you got a problem. Anyways, I got Councilor Reed, Councilor Hodge. Hey, mine was just on parking, so my favorite subject. Um, at the back of the site, mm -hmm. down by the hedge, does the elevation go down a bit? It does, doesn't it? Yes. So my question is, I don't want to spend gazillions of money, but I would like to ask if, how much it would be if you're just going to go out and do some mm -hmm. interesting stuff. How much it would be to go just, we probably have to go a little bit down and then a little bit up on that back portion to put another level up. Now, okay. I'm uh, not because we've got other buildings coming there and I always want to keep in mind that that whole parking lot at some time may become a building and with mm -hmm. parking underneath. But I also know that we're short of parking everywhere up there so it doesn't hurt to have the other level. So I guess my question is this, while we're into it and we're digging everything up and moving everything around, how much more would it be to do that as, you know, on top of Reorging the, reorganizing the whole parking lot. Okay, we can, we can add that too. So just to be clear, you're talking about the the drive and boulevard right behind the hedges. Down at the back portion. Far west. It's the drive. Far west. The far west that goes to the uh, the far access west. road. It it's oh, and the, and it goes up to the bubble. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, through the chair. That's that's the row of hedges. That that is a buffer between. Yeah. Our facility and the single family homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you start at the hedges and come this way or towards Dogwood up to east in there. I just think it would be I, I would just like to know how much it would be. Simple question. Yep. Well, because it wouldn't be that far above grade is what I'm getting at. It it goes down anyhow, so and we can always use extra parking up there for everything, and it's the one logical spot to put it. I just want to make a comment through the chair. Um, we, we can look at these parking, various parking issues, as, as we will, kind of in a piecemeal uh, manner. However, the, the, the real right way to do this is to look at the entire precinct parking issue. 
and try to ensure the maximum efficiencies of, of the entire parking in the precinct. And, and that may or may not include some other alternatives such as what's been discussed around this council table in the past of um, whether it's viable or not, I don't know, but there's been talk around the table about possibly closing Winslow at some point and, and, and expanding that and turning that into parking. I mean, we will certainly look at these little piecemeal issues and get some pricing. However, um, it's normally not the best way to deal with the maximum efficiency of parking as a whole, just so council is aware of that. I get it. I'm yeah. just thinking we're tearing it all up now. Let's just... No, understood. Yeah. What's wrong? Okay. Well, yeah, and I'm one of the ones that have been asking the question about Winslow and what's mm -hmm. the function of Winslow because, you know, eastbound on Winslow is really just an entrance into into the precinct now. Very few people come in there to turn right to go down to Poirier because they, they have Barry. So I, I like to sort of look at the whole, the whole thing. Um, I agree with what the mayor said. I think we need to look at, you know, try how to ex expand and extend the the, uh, the the disabled parking that we have now. But uh, the, the whole thing is that we, we've got a lot of these, you know, we've got a road here, we've got a road over here, we've got one at the far end down by the hedge, uh, we've got a road here that goes, a parking area here that goes nowhere. Uh, and, I mean, this is all wasted space. If you were designing a parking lot, you probably would have put these stalls over here, had the driveway come up the middle so that row in here is lost except for people getting to the stall. So I think that, you know, I'd like to see a whole sort of rework. I mean, it may not be something we tackle. It may be that the short term is, you know, paint is cheap, but I wouldn't want to start going into things and then discovering that all we've done is added eight stalls because to me, I'm, I'm looking at like adding 40 uh, and we've got a lot of unused surface there that's just for driving in and out. I think we've got one driveway in and two driveways out and uh, and you know drive areas between stalls the dead end when they could actually go out and serve as the driveway as well as the access to those stalls and and I just think we have to really take a look at that whole parking lot and figure out how do we maximize the the number of stalls given that we have more and more people using the the seniors uh, uh, center right now and with the idea that down the road maybe we even incorporate some of Winslow Avenue into that. And I think that, I agree, I think we need to look at a whole parking, the whole precinct, not just what's here, but what's on the other side. There's the potential that some buildings may come down and be replaced. And so I think that's all sort of part of the, you know, some of the pieces to the puzzle. I'd like to see at some point we've talked about doing a, a precinct review of just what is the Poirier precinct going to be uh, in the future. Um, so maybe that becomes part of it, but I think I, I want us to look at some, some short-term parking fixes, but I want to do it with the idea that, that this, is, this is an area that, of you know, the, uh, the recreation complex that really, I think, needs a complete rethink and, and make sure we maximize the parking for everybody. Thank you. Council Officer. Well, thank you. Well, I guess my concerns as related to the height issues about losing the parking that we have there when we built the facility. I raised it at the time. People didn't think at that time that this was a little used parking area was underutilized and it wouldn't be missed. I think what we're trying to do now is understand that that parking lot was well used and well needed. And we're now trying to refix a problem and we made the decision, <coughs> we as council made the decision to put this facility there and we're there now. Um, but my issue comes from to, to staff. Um, and better information that when we're dealing with projects, this one's we're, we're going to, we need better reports on the impacts of the parking in that area. We need better information as to what the effects on the existing facilities will be, whether it be handicapped, regular parking stalls. We're talking about Dogwood, but when you look at Centennial Pavilion, all the functions that run down there that has no direct parking, it now has to use, those functions will use the regular parking aside of Dogwood there. So what I want to see is, is better information to staff on the parking in their reports coming to staff when we're looking at future facilities or upgrades to facilities. And I think really in the whole Poirier complex um, that's been raised by other councillors about the, the parking in that area and I don't think we meet our own parking standards bylaws for all the facilities we have in there. But, and I agree with Mayor Stewart on, on what I'd like to see is his suggestions on this. But I'd also like to know as a one, 
and then a 1A, the redesign, you know, are you going to spend so much money to just do this little piece, but in conjunction, would it be cheaper to do the whole parking as one package? So I'd like to see those, those options put together as a cost effective, because really now what we're talking about, we made the decision there, we've lost that parking, we've realized that that parking has created a problem, the loss of that parking in that area. So now we have to look at how we can recreate the parking, excuse me, in that area. And I, I think we do need to do that for next year in the budget. And as Brent said, you know, we don't have an authorized budget for that, but I think we need to know what that would be and what those options would be in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I find I find this a very interesting conversation because the parking issue was obvious when the dry floor facility was approved, and someone th this is not a, a, a staff problem. This is really a council issue. Is that you know we we see these things and then we go ahead and improve it. So this is the problem. One of the staff pointed it out today. Thank you. This is the problem when we do piecemeal things without a plan, and I think it's really disappointing because I remember the night that we approved the DVP for the height variance, and I remember asking the question specifically about whether the parking lot reconfiguration would be in the $3.9 million, and uh, what I heard was yes, it would be, and now we're talking about closing off Winslow and <coughs> As a South Coquitlam resident that uses it regularly, Winslow does get used. I think Councillor Edmondson drives a bus down Winslow many All times the time. a week. Can't close it. It's the access point to Winslow Centre there from the school district. It's access point, access point to Blue Mountain Park, to Scout Hall. It, for people that live in South Coquitlam, it is actually a used road. Oh, yeah. So I would certainly be very cautious about talking about closing off Winslow for people that live in South Carolina. So anyway, I just wanted to make the point that it is disappointing and it's not staff's fault. It's, it's, it's working outside of a plan and I really think that as a council we have to get much more discipline in making plans and working the plans because now to have to go back to the taxpayer and say we spent $3.9 million on a covered sports facility and now we're going to ask for who knows how much more to reconfigure the parking lot. It just doesn't sit well with the tax. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to wind her up. But the one thing I must say that, you know, I think we need to have a meeting with a Dogwood executive to say, look, you know, you people have to enforce the parking. If you have to put stickers in every member's window that they just, put. I, I know I've got a sticker in my window for my place. And every night the security guard checks whether you're allowed to be in there or not. And if there isn't, you get a note on your window. So, you know, those are the things, being polite and pleasant, you know, not just throw a car away, but uh, leave some notes behind. And, and I bet you any money, there's doesn't matter how much parking space you're going to put in there, you'll be short of parking spaces. Because the students, the teachers, everybody will be using it. And other people from the community are using it. So there's got to be something before we blow a whole lot of money for more parking and not accomplish anything. I think those are things that we have to do. So I'm going to wind up this discussion. Uh, motion to receive for information. I move. Second. It's already moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next slide. Moving on to other business, our first other business item is women and children's swim time. This was raised by Councillor Cirillo. Councillor Cirillo. Uh, this is in regards to uh, a communication that Council and Mayor received in June about a request from a resident to look into a swim opportunity for females and small children. And um, I, I have to admit myself, I didn't respond. I didn't respond and I, I don't think I sent it on to staff either to respond. So. Um, I was just wondering if the option has been discussed in the past and if the city has considered this as an option to just encourage more swimming participation for women, including young moms, uh, in the past. I just wanted to have an understanding of, of what's been discussed in the past. Yes, uh, through the chair. Um, uh, yes, in fact, I think uh, Coquitlam had it in 1998 and it was discontinued because of uh, lack of, uh, lack of interest. Um, uh, lack of participation. Um, we we have received the request and we are looking into it. Um, 
we haven't made any decisions. There are a number of things to consider. Uh, the ex there's a cost. Uh, there's opportunities in programming. There's uh, a number of municipalities do do this. Um, Burnaby, Richmond, North Vancouver, Surrey, they all do it, and uh, with with different scheduling opportunities. And and we have to look at what they offer and how they do it. And once we're in a position to uh, bring some information forward to council, we will. Uh, at this point, uh, we're we're really just exploring the, uh, the issue. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. That's really just what I wanted to understand. Was this something that we've done in the past, and we're already doing it? So thank you very much. You're welcome. Here. Yeah. And I did pass it on to the staff because we had received. I'd received a similar request uh, some time earlier, and the previous person in your position had expressed. Well, it, 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 we hadn't gotten anywhere, um, but I was a lifeguard at Chimo, and we used to have ladies keep fit. And uh, it was just a, it was a well-subscribed program in its day. It, uh, its popularity waxed and waned, and when it waned, uh, I guess it, it uh, wasn't as popular. It wasn't popular enough to keep it. Uh, let's have a look at it. So I guess uh, what I should I did suggest. Pass it on to staff, but sorry, man. Yeah, go ahead. ahead. You know what? I suggest that maybe you bring the report to council. Uh, what are the municipalities are doing? Uh, how's the best way to handle it, how are the other communities handling it, and the council may choose either one or some of it or none of it. Is that a good idea? Well, Let's get a report to council yes. to be able to yep. make a decision, okay? Yep. Anything further on the uh, untabled items? Yep, so our second other business item is BC on the move, 10-year transportation plan raised by Councillor O'Neill. Yes. Um, City, the city and city council, anyway, received uh, a letter from the uh, Kirsten Peterson, executive Dir project director, BC on the Move, Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure, um, writing to us to invite us uh, to participate in a meeting with officials from the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure over the next few weeks regarding a 10 year transportation plan. Um, and um, so th this was actually personal invitation to mayor and council, but it's probably a, probably better put to staff. And I want to know if staff has responded, what sort of input staff would put into this, but they want our our ideas as well. We're always talking about transportation around here, everything from uh, better bus routes to Fremont Connector, which I know has come up in, in uh, Port Coquitlam quite recently with a, a bit of fire and brimstone. Um, and there's a lot of other issues, of course, regarding transportation. So. Do we, are we going to participate? Um, do we have a position? Uh, do you want our input as council? Um, yes, we are planning to participate, and Joseph will be our main representative. Uh, Joseph will let everybody know when that meeting is. It hasn't set up yet, but we will let you know if you want to participate. We see this as largely an opportunity for staff to put forward existing uh, issues that council has previously identified. The topical issues, from my perspective, are the brunette interchange. Uh, which is a provincial issue that uh, we're not totally comfortable with what they're planning at the present time, so we would put that on the table. And the other issue that, that you highlighted, we would describe it as um, issues connecting or interconnecting municipal issues that aren't necessarily perfectly dealt with. And then we'll have a number of examples. The Fremont Connector will be one, Lincoln Avenue, uh, and Victoria will be others related to Poco. But there will be others as well, for example, issues with New West and others. Uh, so we would have an umbrella package of how do communities deal with issues when they're not totally aligned on boundary streets. Now Joseph may have other ideas as well, but Joseph will be the main person dealing with that. So do you have anything further to add on that, Joseph? Uh, yes, sir, through your worship. Um, uh, we did receive the uh, BC on the Move 10-year plan, which is a very, very high-level plan. So um, I guess the only thing what I can emphasize here is that when we go and meet the ministry representatives, we have to be mindful of that while this is a high um, uh, view plan, um, there may be some overlaps and or conflicts with the mayor's council's plans uh, presented to uh, TransLink and the ministry earlier this year. So we just have to be mindful of that. The second thing is appreciating that this is a high level plan. Um, we would bring to the table uh, comments on the transit servicing need uh, for the city of Coquitlam. Uh, the rest was covered by both of you.
Yeah, so they really do want to know our priorities as well. So I think. So do we need any further council input on that? Do you feel, or do you feel you know quite well what council council's priorities are? Um, I, I think uh, we have a good feel for it. Um, unfortunately, the consultations will have to take place by the 7th of November. Yes. So that doesn't give us a, a lot of time. So what I suggest is that if council agrees with the uh, three points we just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, then if any one of you or council as a whole has additional ideas that should be a priority, just please let staff know and we'll take it forward. But don't don't have, expect a council report prior to the no, meeting. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Very tight timeline. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty happy with what I heard, and if I think of anything else, I'll let you know. Thank you. Mayor. Given the third component that you described, to what extent is the North Fraser, I'll say it, the North Fraser Perimeter Road, encompassed by any of that? Because that, so you've described intermunicipal issues, you described um, local issues, but that vast regional, I mean, we, we could have an a vast regional plan that gets completely set aside um, for reasons that aren't regional. It's uh, such a high level plan that there is no mention of the uh, North Fraser perimeter road in this document. However, this is uh, a very important issue from our perspective, and we'll be more than happy to take it to the discussion. I personally think it fits into that interconnected issue, uh, and it could be an example of that. We'll have a number of examples. Um, they're not going to solve it uh, with, with one, one meeting or one document. Uh, there is an ongoing process in terms of looking at how to get truck movements through that tight corridor, given different people's perspectives. We are planning, well, I would I have, to suggest, I have to discuss it further with Joseph in terms of exactly what the strategy should be, but we will discuss the need for a higher level of government to examine region-wide needs, and if all parties don't uh, see it the same way, somebody has to come through and make sure there's still connectivity and there's still those movements that happen. In an ideal world, uh, TransLink should be doing that, um, but I'm not sure they're doing it as effectively as they could. And so the province is doing this kind of plan, we plan on highlighting that in this kind of plan. Thanks. I think it might be a good idea. You know, this, the staff are going to go to this meeting, aren't they? So I think the staff should outline some things that we think we need here in the city to improve the, our uh, transportation in the city, but also work with other cities on it. But I think very, very important that we look after Coquitlam first, okay, and put a report to the council members as what we're doing to see if the council members want to add anything on it or not. Fair enough? Absolutely. Okay. I don't think we need the most to receive the next item. Well, well, yeah. What we will be doing, just to be very clear, is we will be making a presentation in accordance with previous council directives. Uh, and we'll provide a copy of that to council. There won't be an opportunity to discuss it with council before we make that presentation. But I am very confident that there will be other opportunities later. Uh, this issue won't be dealt with in one document. And that's fair enough. Okay, anything else, uh, Joseph? No? No, thank you. Okay, next slide. No, so, so sorry. I just, oh, sorry, sorry. You mentioned uh, the, the mayor's plan about the transit and everything and how that's a priority, but are we saying that that's one of our top priorities as well, or is that just a given? Because I, I wouldn't want it just to sort of be said, well, that's just a given, we don't have to worry about that, but I think we need to make transit a, one of our top priorities, if that's what they're looking for in this kind of uh, consultation as well. I do believe that this is a uh, specific uh, high priority for the city of Coquitlam, particularly in line um, in, in sight of the development activities that are occurring in the northeast. And, and the way we'll likely present this, it will be presenting issues. We won't be putting it into this is a one, this is two, this is number three. There's issues that are weaknesses in the way the current structure works, uh, and any plan that they come to uh, come up with should address those issues. We won't be saying priority number one, priority two, number three. I, yeah, and I just want to make sure transit is just. Yeah. Okay, anything further? No. That's it. Okay, next item. Other business item three raised by Councillor Hodge is garbage collection and 
bears, I believe? Yeah, just on, on the garbage collection. I Motion think. to table. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> What would a meeting be here if we didn't have a chance to discuss the new uh, garbage collection? And I'd How are they looking bears in your pictures? The, the bears were doing uh, quite well. Unfortunately, I think uh, of late they've got into the garbage. So uh, we've had a couple of letters uh, concerning bears in, uh, in garbage and the timing of the garbage pickup, particularly in areas where we are close to uh, wildlife, in, you know, the interface areas. Um, and I note that uh, where I live on Burke Mountain, that uh, there is sometimes very late in the day before the, uh, the solid waste uh, cans uh, get picked up or the, the black cans. Um, and as, as much as I know that people are trying to get to all the um, organics into the green cans, there are still uh, things that uh, um, may be cross-contaminated, whether it's just wrappers or something that can't go into the green can and it uh, becomes an attraction to bears. Um, we had a family of bears on, on my street last week, and at uh, 3.30, the green cans had all been picked up, and they were into the, into the regular cans, and, uh, and, and I went over and looked, and yeah, not everybody is, is certainly getting the message of what goes into what can, but some of the cans that had been tipped over and that the bears were going through uh, clearly was, was not the organics. Uh, yet at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they were still out becoming a, a bear attraction. <coughs> So that would be my first question is, is the, the timing of trying to get those uh, second trucks in faster on the areas where, we, uh, where we're near wildlife. Um, through the chair, um, we've been dealing with these um, and, and similar problems for a couple of months now, if not uh, since day one of the new service implementation. And um, we are still actively working with the um, service provider we have made numerous changes to the garbage routes and also to the timing. This process is ongoing, mm -hmm. and uh, I have um, uh, two or three examples uh, handy if needed where we changed the garbage pickup time uh, in uh, areas known to be frequented by bears. Now, the system is not perfect because uh, on each day, each truck would have to uh, service something like 1,200 to 1,400 uh, homes and it's a very large number of homes to be serviced so even if you set your priorities relatively right these areas are big so it, it, it certainly takes several hours to get from the uh, top to the bottom or whichever way they would start. Um, also uh, my understanding is that um, each day uh, two different trucks are on the route. Uh, one kind of truck uh, in the areas um, or trucks will pick up the garbage where the other kinds of trucks are picking up the uh, green waste. So it is conceivable that um, uh, the um, green waste uh, would be picked up at um, 8 a.m. and the garbage uh, would be picked up at 8.05 because it's two different trucks. Um, the the uh, best solution we have is that as we become aware of more and more of these problems, uh, then um, we try to uh, work with the service provider to further refine the pickup schedule within the daily routes. And of course, we also um, uh, we have a very good idea about the bear sightings in the area. We have our own phone line where we receive the calls directly. And of course, uh, there is the provincial um, phone line, and we uh, frequently talk to the provincial conservation officer service, so we know um, <coughs> how many bear bears are in which area. And in fact, I just talked to our um, wildlife coordinator on uh, Friday, and unfortunately, the bears, um, they still have about a month, uh, maybe a month and a half to go before they would go into hibernation. So I do expect that this problem is going to go on for a while yet, but at the same time, on the positive side, this will give us more information and more opportunity to refine <coughs> the routes. Okay. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I'm, I'm concerned about is that in some cases, even the green cans do sit out because you have to take the clips off of them. And, and we've had a number of discussions about, you know, you know taking the clips off and you, you have to take them off when you put them out in the morning. But um, I've also heard that there are certain garbage cans, and I know we didn't purchase them, but at some point we're going to have to start replacing cans, that there are cans out there 
that automatically unclip when they're when they're they're tipped. And I'm just wondering if maybe in these areas where we where we have this bare problem and they're even getting into the green cans, that maybe we should look. Uh, and I understand they're compatible with the lifts and everything that we use. They just have a different, uh, more of an automatic unlocking mechanism that uh, that could be used. I'm just wondering if we've looked at that or if that's something we can move to. Yes, we have looked at these, uh, this and some other options, and um, we talked to uh, some communities uh, in Alaska uh, where they have been using these cans. And unfortunately, the report uh, was not encouraging because they have a lot of problems uh, using these um, cans. The whole idea is that the lid would automatically open as the can is tipped upside down. But in many instances, and it's a very reasonably high percentage, I think like 30 or 40 percent of these cans, when they are tipped upside down, uh, they don't open. They get stuck. And, and so uh, basically it renders them impractical for regular use. Uh, the other problem with these cans is that um, it can happen that for whatever reason um, uh, they get tipped up by um, um, either by some mechanical means or by some larger animals uh, and even though they are not entirely upside down they can open up and then uh, it's free for all not only for bears but other kind of wildlife like various birds and whatnot so uh, for all practical purposes the information what we have is convincing enough that this is not an option that we should look at further and my last question is just something I raised a couple of weeks ago is uh, the lanes. If we started staff started looking at uh, uh, how many lanes are affected and uh, and you know just that's what we hear a lot about is the you know the loss of uh, collection in some of the lanes around Coquitlam and uh, just wondering if we have anything further on that at this point yet. Um, we haven't completed um, our review of this situation. Um, but we started to get some preliminary numbers, and it appears that um, while for the vast majority of Coquitlam residences, the pickup point hasn't changed, uh, and we need to keep in perspective that we are picking up garbage and green waste from some 25,000 households, um, there are uh, approximately uh, just over a thousand, maybe 1,400. Um, homes where uh, the pickup location has changed. Now, for some of these locations, we managed to put the pickup point back where it used to be, e.g. to the lanes, where for others we are still working uh, with the garbage company to see what modification may be necessary to put it back. Um, and in some instances it will be possible, but a variety of improvements might be necessary and some of them could be quite costly. When I'm talking about improvements, I'm thinking in some instances um, uh, ditch infills um, or improving the surf, um, the driving surface of the lane, um, uh, straightening out uh, perhaps uh, uh, fence lines, if you like, by trimming vegetation. And uh, certainly we need to look at um, some encroachments which do exist and prevent um, pickup from the lanes. Now. Um, it's relatively easy to come up with a long list of what needs to get done, but uh, to, to go through the process, it's going to take some time. Okay, okay thank you. Anything further? Oh, that's good, thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, so sorry, I, I, sorry, to do you had a question on oh, the, the garbage. So, um, it's sort of like on Craig's point, but um, so I, I start work at 6 o'clock in the morning downtown, I put my garbage, uh, my green can at the end of my driveway at 5 a.m., take the locks off. Um, so I'm not sorry, I'm not supposed to put them at 5 a.m. It's 7.30, isn't that the time that you're supposed 5 to? 5.30? 5.30. You put them on at 5.30, uh, the truck comes at 8 o'clock, so the bears have two and a half hours to get into my green waste. Um, and that seems to be part of the problem, is, is just the time that, that they're sitting there. So what what... Do we have any plan or strategy to try to figure out what to do in those cases? Like I know you can't, it's not ideal, but um, we're always going to have a time period where the bears can get into the cans. Well, exactly. Um, there are two approaches what we've been trying to um, employ. One is uh, to 
reduce the period of time when the garbage uh, is on the curbside and in a way it's available for wildlife to um, do something with it. Um, so with the uh, 530 pickup and the possible earlier, sorry, the 530 takeout garbage time in between the garbage actually gets picked up, uh, we are trying to minimize the time frame particularly when, it, when we know it's really necessary. But the other approaches which um, should be more uh, practical and over time powerful is education. Uh, it, it's never going to be 100 percent, but uh, I <coughs> believe that over the last uh, probably decade, um, Metro Vancouver wide, we have made uh, really good progress in educating the people what they should or should not put into the garbage, particularly in areas where there are wildlife concerns. <laughs> and if we continue this education, um, I think eventually uh, the risk is going to be reduced. It, it can't be really eliminated, but can be substantially reduced. I, I agree it can be reduced, but even if everybody's doing everything perfectly, you still have two hours, ultimately, sometimes where uh, the can is unlocked and, and in the middle of summer where it's warm and it's been sitting in that can for, for uh, a week. Um, it just seems to me that we're always going to have this, this problem. And, and this year we had more bears put down than in, in previous years. And, you know, I, I just, I'm not, I guess I'm not convinced that education and, and trying to time our schedules better is, is going to get us far enough to, to deal with this problem. Yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, I'm, I'm quite aware of a number of initiatives that those who know a lot about wildlife um, uh, have been thinking about. And uh, over the last 10 years, I haven't come across a perfect solution. So as, like I said, um, uh, the number one thing is to um, reduce the exposure of the garbage to wild, wildlife. That's the, um, that can be achieved by various municipal garbage bylaws when we regulate when the cans can be picked, uh, put out and try to shorten the time frame before um, the garbage gets picked up. The second thing is education, and we talked about it quite a bit. Um, the third thing is um, kind of more interesting, how to, keep, how to try to keep the bears away from the garbage. And I'm aware of some uh, opinions in the past and then the uh, opposite of these opinions. There was, there's a principal idea, or was, that if you provide an area somewhere up in the wilderness, um, relatively high above the populated um, urbanized areas, and you provide food and additional food for the bear colony uh, in those areas, then bears would go there and they would eat um, whatever wild fruits um, we would grow for them. Uh, and then they would stay there. And in, in, in theory, it sounds really, really good. But then in, in practical um, terms, according to biologists, uh, wildlife biologists, they say that if you did that, um, it would be such a convenient place for the wildlife to feed on that their population would grow to a point where an area of this special area would not be able to support that population and the um, overspill would come down again to urbanized areas. So in other words, it's, it's a no-go. So I, I know, I know uh, the city is saving some money by using an automated system. Um, I know there's less injuries because they're not lifting big cans and all that sort of thing. I guess what I'm just wondering though is at some point if we continue to have all of these problems. Um, so let's say next summer, by next summer, you know, people are, are sorting their kitchen scraps better and, and uh, but we're still having all these bear issues and we're still having to put down more bears than, than in the past. Did we ever contemplate having a second person on the truck that their only job is to unlock the cans? In, um, in, these, in these high bear areas. Also back up. Uh, at, at this point, um, we haven't looked at this option. Uh, we did look into uh, an option not for the purpose of uh, dealing with the wildlife, but um, uh, we are aware of uh, some of our residents for certain reasons um, are in the need of an enhanced level of service. 
and <coughs> for the ten hands service we are looking at uh, in the range of 35 36 dollars per month per household to provide that so should we have a um, second uh, person on the trucks uh, for an, a sort of an enhanced service that would come with a cost and uh, uh, also there would be some additional time involved to do that so it's it's questionable uh, whether it's worthwhile to look at it or not however on that note and by no means I want to get on the soapbox here but I, I, I'd like to mention that uh, to start with um, uh, dealing with wildlife, it's principally the provincial government's responsibility, and they are to do it through the uh, uh, Conservation Officer Service. Now, uh, some 10 years ago or so, they started to download these issues to the municipalities, and of course, the municipalities ever since have been paying for this, uh, because we had to step up our processes, we had to change our bylaws, we have to modify our um, services, particularly for garbage and, uh, and garbage keeping at the households at the cost of the city. Um, in the meantime, um, the number of tickets issued by the Provincial Conservation Officer Service was extremely low and perhaps inadequately low and the pressure was on the municipalities to issue tickets based on municipal bylaws which perhaps didn't even exist 10 years ago. So now uh, some municipalities are in the position because they changed the garbage pickup, uh, they changed the garbage bylaw, they brought in bylaws that would enable the municipalities to issue related tickets, but uh, it's still questionable who should be doing it. I'm certainly supportive of providing more education, uh, particularly if um, um, we can provide a consistent message perhaps uh, within Metro Vancouver or within those communities where this is an issue. Uh, but uh, to take full responsibility for uh, these kind of issues uh, at the municipality's cost is questionable. Uh, yes. Has our pickup times changed from previous system to this system for garbage pickup, for people putting out the garbage? I don't think it has. I can't answer the question, but I'll be happy to look into it and let you know. I'm, I'm almost certain that in some areas it changed, that it had to change. Um, and also, uh, I believe previously the city of Coquitlam had a five-day pickup, whereas now we have... No, it's four days. It's always been four days. Okay. But I'm, I'm certain that there have been it, some changes. Cans were always right seven, five, five to seven last time. So, so, we, so we have the same time. We didn't have locking garbages then. We had people mixed with garbage. We, we had simmer farms and, and bears and, and, and bears being put down. In the since we've become a bearware community, has goes up and down. It changes between year and year depending on birth rate. So um, to equate it strictly to this new system of garbage, this new system of garbage also eliminated one issue: of people putting the plastic garbage bags out on the side, which were a, a, an easy feeder for bears. So I think the issue is: I think what Joseph has pointed out is that we are almost a bear smart community, one of the few ones that are doing the extra, uh, a wildlife coordinator and all the other things in to, to deal with the animal wildlife. But the garbage system isn't the change that's making it better or worse, because it was the same before, and you didn't have locking garbage cans before, and they were out there for two to three hours or whatever, where bears could access them before. So I think the issue about saying that this system is causing it is, is incorrect, that it's, it's always been that situation and we always put our garbage out in the morning I live in a bare area we use the green can and stuff most of the time it would go out you'd be okay sometimes it, it bears may get into it but the the issues are some of the laneway issues I think that Councillor Hodge raised an issue um, has staff I sent you a, an information about a, a truck that can pick up both sides is and I really think on that issue that the contractor should be picking up the cost. They, they bid on this contract and that these type of issues about the laneways where you have a smaller truck that has a 
arm that pivots from side to side can pick up on either side of the laneway and come in and out should be at their responsibility and cost to fix that problem, not our responsibility to repave or widen lanes. Because they bid the contract, they should have anticipated some of these issues within it. So that's another issue that I'd like to say. Um, I think we probably would need at some point in time, I guess we will be doing an update on our um, Bear, Bear Smart yes. and where we're at and yes. how we're becoming more and more compliant every year. But I think we've been working at this for about six years and we hired, I think, Drake full time as our bearware coordinator and well, well, about three years ago. So, thank you. Okay, okay Mayor. Okay, um, yeah, I, I, I'm tempted to agree because in the past, the green cans weren't locked, and now they're locked uh, for six days of the week. And so there's a four hour window or five hour window where they're unlocked. I'm not certain that that's any, it's certainly not as bad as it was when they were in the room in the carport unlocked for the whole time. And the plastic bags were always an issue. In fact, I would argue that the, the problem we're seeing now with the chafer beetle and more crows eating lawns is probably much more related to the automated system because the crows can't get at the green waste anymore. And we used to be able to get at oh, yeah. it because they, all my neighbors had plastic bags and they were all getting ripped open. And, and my son, that was related really to a band of sure pesticides. Hmm? Wasn't that really related to a band of pesticides? Why don't you have time? But this year, the chafer beetle is worse, and I think it's because we, we now walk up the green waste a lot, yeah, a lot better. Year but on the, um, on the other one, I'm, I'm tempted to suggest we, we figure out how much it would cost to add the swamper to the trucks on the green areas in, for Monday, Tuesday, and for, a, for a, say, one truck four hours on Wednesday and Thursday to get the lanes uh, so that we can back trucks back out of the lanes um, that by itself, we could cover the cost of the Wednesday, Thursday. I'm, I would argue that the Monday, Tuesday is probably the contractor's challenge because he did bid um, that that's where the garbage is and figure it out. Um, but um, and that way, we could have someone that does unclip the greens on the plateau and on Hazel and the, the, those areas that are serious. Um, we would, over the course of one season, I suspect, change the behavior of a generation of, of yearlings. So that they realize there is no there's smelly saran wrap, but that doesn't it's not really a satisfying meal in the garbage. Uh, the real good stuff's in the green waste, but I can't get at it because the, the, that swamper's coming down 30 seconds ahead of a truck uh, and opening up the opening up the lid. So is that a possibility for one year? I you know, figure how many trucks do we have on green? Four. Um. Unfortunately, I did come across this number, but I just can't remember, and I would not want to okay. guess. But if it's four, it's probably say, eight months, $50,000, or 30000 for the two days of, of Swamper. That's less than 150000 for the for the whole season, and that's uh, like in the order of 5% of our, of our contract cost. And it might be worth trying it for one season and seeing if we can keep the bears <coughs> in the woods because they can't get at, the, can't get any, at any kind of food. We're, we're, we're going to see them going after the salmon, so the salmon over the next few weeks, so that'll that'll fatten them up, and that'll we've probably seen the end of the garbage. At least the salmon would be better food. But is it something we could start next March? Oh, maybe the guy unlocking a canvas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could spray him with bear <laughs> repellent, <laughs> okay? <laughs> have, have him pepper spray his clothes. Um, but anyway, I just. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Councilor Wilson, well, yeah. I'm going to cut out the debate. Yeah, no, I'll be real quick. I, I'm not saying the, the new system is causing problems. I think it's helping it, right, and it's, it's making it better. I'm sorry if it made it sound like I thought it was causing problems. But as, as we continue to keep building further and further uh, east um, in the Burke Mountain area, we're just we're just encroaching more and more on, on the Bears' territory, and I think we need to come up with a better solution than, than, uh, than what we have now because... Um, it's not the bear's fault, it's our fault, and I think we got to uh, to make sure that we look at something like that. Thanks. Okay, that's the end of the debate. Move adjourn. Yeah, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Opposed, carried. Okay, we'll be back in at 25 to 4. That's 10 minutes.